Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've just started using reading glasses, and if I put them on, you're just a blur. So, so you're always a blur, but anyway, there we go. So, um, my name is Martin Phillipson, and as Dean at the College of Law, I'm delighted to welcome you to the Gertler Family Lectureship in Law, honoring the Robert McKercher family as part of our McKercher Lecture Series here at the College. Before I begin, we should acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis, and we pay our respect to the First Nation and Métis ancestors of this place, and we reaffirm our relationship with one another. I'd like to thank Bukircha for their continued sponsorship of our lecture series over the last three years, allowing us to present a wide range of informative, educational, and entertaining speakers. Um, Bukircha has a culture of hard work, integrity, innovation, and most importantly, community. And we're very proud that they partner with us uh, in bringing the lecture series to us. The Gertler Family Lectureship in Law, devoted to subjects related to law and ethics, is generally funded by Dr. Maynard Gertler, a distinguished graduate of the University of Saskatchewan and an internationally renowned cardiologist who, amongst other things, presidents of the United States of America, in honor of the McKercher family of Saskatoon. And now to introduce our speaker, I want to hand things over to my good friend, Michelle Willette, QC of McKercher LLP. Thank you, Dean Phillipson, um, especially for the kind words about my law firm. Um, on behalf of the McKercher Law Firm, and I know I speak as well for the entire College of Law, we are truly honored to welcome the Right Honorable Richard Wagner to deliver the Gertler Family Lecture in Law. Chief Justice Wagner was born in Montreal on April 2nd, 1957. He studied at Collège Jean de Brébeuf in Montreal and obtained the Diploma of College Studies in 1975. <clears throat> he earned a Bachelor of Social Sciences with a major in Political Science from the University of Ottawa in 1978, graduating cum laude. He received a Licentiate in Laws from the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Law in 1979, again graduating cum laude. Richard Wagner, as he then was, was called to the Quebec Bar in 1980 and practiced law until being appointed to the Quebec Superior Court on September 24, 2004. He was a partner in what is now the law firm of Lavery, a partner there from 1980 to 2004. His practice there focused mainly on professional liability of lawyers, accountants, architects, and engineers and on commercial litigation related in particular to real estate law, oppression remedies, and class actions. He argued cases before all Quebec courts and quasi-judicial tribunals, as well as before the federal court and the Supreme Court of Canada. Since assuming the leadership of the court, the Chief Justice has spoken about the idea of bringing the court closer to the people it serves. And his presence here today is a demonstration of that ethos. Please welcome Chief Justice Wagner. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle, for that uh, generous presentation. Do you hear well? No? Um, but before I, I, um, I tackle the topic of my lecture today, I, I just wish to um, tell you all how, ha how happy I am to be here with you this afternoon uh, for two reasons. The first one is this. Uh, this is my first visit to Saskatoon. And uh, judging by the warm welcome I got yesterday and today, it won't be my last. But the second reason is that uh, it gives me the opportunity to meet um, with Catherine Starks. Now you'll see who's Catherine Starks. Well, you have to know. <laughs> you have to know. <laughs> you have to know that two weeks ago, almost, um, 
all the uh, justices of the Supreme Court uh, chose their clerks for 2021. It's a long process, and um, we got almost 250 applications. And um, so I chose 10 out of those 250, and uh, Catherine was one of the 10. And then I interviewed the 10, and then Catherine became one of the fourth. And uh, but it was by Skype, so uh, so today is by my opportunity to meet in person with, uh, with Catherine. So that's the reason of my pleasure to be here. Um, I'm looking forward to, to work with her in two years from now. Um, as a lawyer and as, as a citizen, as a judge, as a Quebecer, and as a Francophone, and as a Canadian, I've thought a lot about the topic I want to speak to you about today, and that is identity. If there's one thing that has been a constant in our constitutional experience and in the Canadian experience, I think that it is identity. So many of the most monumental and even divisive questions that this country has faced touch on what it means to bear a personal characteristic, to belong to a group, to speak a language, or to come from a place. Deliberation on these issues has unfolded in the courts, just as it has in the broader public sphere. Almost 40 years after the advent of the Charter of Rights, these debates are still vigorous. Struggles over rights, including legal struggles, are part of how identities have come to be defined in our country. Tied up with the concept of identity is the concept of dignity. Our jurisprudence has moved away from examining dignity as part of the equality analysis. But dignity remains a foundational concept on which the Charter of Rights and instruments like it are built. Together, identity and dignity help give our lives meaning, and support the very democracy on which our country is built. Identities are not just what make us different and diverse. They are what make us what we are. Your identity or your multiple identities are personal. And even, uh, even as they bind you to a group, a person's identity is inextricably tied with her dignity because these two fundamental concepts go to the very heart of what makes a human being. Judges are occasionally called upon to define the specific breadth and limits of identities in law. I'm thinking of cases like Pauli, which established indicia of miti identity. Judges are also asked to weigh in on whether differential treatment on the basis of identity is justifiable in a free and democratic society. When it comes to identity, judicial reasoning has evolved considerably, particularly since the Charter of Rights. Questions of language, gender, religion, and sexual orientation have passed in and out of the constitutional spotlight and in and out of public debate. Along the way, judges have come to recognize that our decisions have a profound effect on how Canadians, and when I say Canadians, I mean everyone who calls this country home, how Canadians see and relate to each other and to themselves. I think it is fair to say that in the past, the Supreme Court of Canada has not always acted with a full appreciation of that impact. I'm thinking specifically about Edwards, the case, the 1928 persons case. This is where our court decided that summoning qualified persons to the Senate meant summoning only men. In light of the court's modern approach to identity and constitutional interpretation, Edwards is remarkable 
as much for its refusal to consider context as for its short-sightedness. The 2016 Daniels case offers a striking contrast. The court was tasked with delineating the scope of the word Indian in section 9124 of the Constitution, deciding whether it included Miti and non-status Indians. It did so with reference to the entire historical, philosophical, and linguistic context. This context included the shared experience of the horrific Indian residential schools. Indeed, the decision began with an acknowledgement of the court's place in the trajector trajectory of reconciliation. The approach could not have been more different to that of Edwards. Almost 40 years of charter adjudication have driven a fundamental change in how judges think of about identity. Both Edwards and Daniels illustrate the kind of line drawing that the court is sometimes called on to do when legal decisions touch on identity. Of course, the court's approach has evolved over time, just as our understanding of identity and its relationship to human dignity and human rights has changed. This is not only because of the charter, although the charter is a significant part of that evolution. Edwards was decided nine decades ago, and much else has changed in the meantime, both in terms of Canadian society and how we see ourselves. In the years following Edwards, the Supreme Court of Canada developed what we now refer as the implied rights jurisprudence. In these decisions, the court used any tool it had available, such as the federalism or a vague notion of rule of law, to protect individual freedoms. For example, in the case of Saumur contre Ville de Québec, City of Quebec, and Roncarelli versus Duplessis, both from the 1950s, the court invalidated a rule and the administrative action that followed from it, judging that it interfered with the rights of religious minorities. These decisions were among the court's first attempts to ensure that everyone, no matter what their religion or identity, could enjoy the right to equality and to participate fully in Canadian society. That said, these decisions did not directly or clearly raise the issue of identity as such, lacking an explicit declaration of human rights or a charter of rights. The court could not adjudicate the effects of these laws on particular individuals. Rightly or wrongly, some have characterized this implied rights jurisprudence as activist. Since the adoption of the Charter of Rights, there is no longer any doubt. Judges do not act anti-democratically by intervening when legislative or executive actions violate the Charter. Citizens have chosen, through their elected representatives, to adhere to a set of fundamental rights reflecting the moral values of Canadian society. The court has the duty and responsibility to interpret the Charter in a way that protects the rights and liberties of Canadians, including the right to fully participate in society, regardless of their identity. This is not judicial activism. This is judicial duty. The Court's current thinking about identity is undoubtedly the built on these and other factors. Nevertheless, I propose to trace what I see as an evolution in judicial reasoning about questions of identity. Earlier, I mentioned that the court sits squarely in the currents of Canadian identity politics. For example, in a case called Cunningham, the court decided that those with overlapping Aboriginal identities 
will sometimes have to choose between them. The human impact of these types of decisions is partly measured in how people see themselves and each other. With our expanding means of communications, this human impact becomes immediate and more direct and more deeply scrutinized. There has never been a time when the media has been more interested in covering judicial affairs, even as their resources dwindle. Social media, too, has fostered a growing engagement with the court's decisions, particularly on Twitter and the other legal blogs. Just about everyone can access and participate in these debates. Almost a year ago, our court began publishing our plain language cases in brief to make our work even more accessible to all Canadians, not just lawyers and judges, so that the citizens can more easily take part in these conversations. Now, experts in political science, sociology, and history are better placed than me to analyze the effects that all of that, all of what I've just talked about, has and will have on identity, both the perceptions and the politics. What I want to delve into, and what I think might be especially interesting to the present and future lawyers and judges in this room, is the judicial perspective on questions of identity. One area of charter jurisprudence, in particular, reveals a great deal of about how judges think about identity. The guarantee of substantive equality enshrined in Section 15 of the Charter. Struggles over how to think about identity have been close to the surface here. Each case squarely raises the question, when is a distinction based on a personal characteristics inappropriate, unjust, or unjustifiable? The court's efforts to answer these difficult questions offer a transparent display of consensus building, collapse, and course corrections. These give rise to three observations about how judges think about identity. First, judges recognize that identity is contextual and complex and not simply a catalog of personal characteristics. But a commitment to a thick understanding of identity sometimes conflicts with the practical demands of judicial decision making. Second, we recognize that different identities, including a judge's own, provide different perspectives on the law and its effects. Seeing things from another perspective is both an obligation and a work in progress. Third, how we think about identity has fundamental implications for the health of our democracy, as informed by the Charter of Rights. Democratic principles ought to inform our thinking about identity as well. For example, the court challenges program may precipitate a new period of equality litigation, benefiting all Canadians. Personal and group characteristics are the starting point of charter equality jurisprudence. But identity is not about labels. It is a shorthand for how people see themselves how others see them, and how those two things interact in people's lives. In other words, it flows from the experience of their personal and group characteristics. Experience is what separates identity from a mere catalog of attributes. Unwillingness to think about identity in terms of experience accounts for the shortcomings of several notorious Bill of Rights cases. For instance, in 1979, the 1979 Bliss case, the court held that discrimination on the basis of pregnancy was not discrimination on the basis of sex. 
a court more attuned to how people actually experience their identities would not have found the connection between the two so elusive. By contrast, by contrast, the court shifted the focus to experience early in its charter equality jurisprudence. Consider the example of disability. The 1997 case of Eaton explained discrimination not with reference to personal characteristics, but with reference to what is actually like to live with those characteristics in a society built around mainstream, mainstream attributes and assumptions. The focus on experience also informs how the court has dealt with age discrimination. Age is a unique type of identity, as the court highlighted in, in the case of Gosling. It divides people at a moment in time. But age unites people over the long term because it is something that everyone experiences. When the court eventually faces a question of touching on transgender identity, these two propositions will provide essential frames of reference. That identity is not fixed, but changing. And that identity is not innate, but contextual. This brings me to the challenge. Is there such a thing as too much context? Certainly, identities are incredibly complex. But judges occupy an institutional role that create a real tension. How do we distill an issue to the essential question to be decided without verging into essentialism? How does a nuanced conception of identity practically translate into a workable and coherent body of jurisprudence? Reasonable minds can differ over the appropriate balance between taking context seriously and making it, making it manageable. With the benefit of hindsight, I think that this balancing act animates some of the divisiveness of the Section 15 jurisprudence and commentary. Our battleground of the 1990s was the restriction of Section 15 to listed and analogous grounds. Justice Leroux Dubé, resisted the use of categories to define discrimination. She reasoned that focusing on abstract categories was too distant from people's real experiences of discrimination. This in turn made it more difficult to see the effect of multiple and overlapping grounds. Nonetheless, the analogous grounds approach carried the day. It focused the inquiry into context and experience. An analogous ground is one based on a personal characteristic that is changeable only at an unacceptable cost to personal identity. The essential inquiry is the magnitude of the choice or the non-choice that someone would actually experience when it comes to changing the relevant personal characteristic. The court decided that although place of residence in the Corbière case in 1999, was not an analogous ground. Residence on or off reserve is. To the extent that it is a choice, living on or off reserve is fundamentally more profound than ordinary decisions about where to live. The 2000s saw the rise and eventual demise of the mirror comparator's approach to discrimination. Defunct since Whitler in 2011, this approach required courts to identify a comparator group that mirrored the group making the claim in every respect, except for the personal characteristic on which the claim is based in order to establish differential treatment. I think that this too is a product of the institutional tension between context and clarity. Equality is a fundamentally comparative question. I can understand why mirror comparators might have been seen as a practical way 
of cutting to the heart of the issue. As it turned out, they were not. The court agreed with robust academic criticism of mirror comparators by isolating a single distinction their use tended to obscure the contextual impact of intersecting grounds of discrimination. The use of comparison group was a vain attempt to bring about a balance between the decisions that ignored the reality of subjective human experience and those that plunged into the heart of that experience. The experience of discrimination varies, sometimes dramatically, depending on the interrelated grounds of discrimination in issue. For example, the experience of a young woman as part of a minority group could be totally different than that of a young man in the same group. And if one of these individuals happens not to be a citizen or suffers a disability, these experiences will be even more different. The court has committed to addressing such intersecting forms of discrimination. But with each intersecting ground, complexity increases too. A promising avenue for further academic inquiry is the development of workable ways to help courts navigate this complexity. Mirror comparators were not the right tool for the job. They failed to capture the nuance of identity. But to be practical, the analytical tools that we use to understand identity must also work within the institutional confines of litigation. They must be feasible in light of the rules of evidence. They must bring the issues of law and principle into sharp focus. Too much emphasis on the context and circumstances of particular groups has a downside. It makes it difficult to articulate a rationale that reaches beyond the four corners of a case. Some measures of generality is a precondition for providing certainty and clear guidance to governments, to lower courts, and to future claimants. In addition to being shaped by context, identity is an inescapable part of how we see the world. It shapes our perspective. Identity is who we are and where we are coming from. It is fundamental to how we make sense of the world. This is as true of those who are subject to laws as it is of those who make and adjudicate them. Justice Wilson posed the following question at a lecture in 1990. Will women judges really make a difference? We now know that the answer is an emphatic yes. Perspective work, perspective took center stage in identity jurisprudence shortly after she and Justice Leroux Dubé were appointed and when they began to make their mark on the same institution that decided the famous case of Edwards. I have no doubt that it was an uphill battle, but these women drove an important institutional learning process. Over time, their decisions forced their colleagues to confront the following reality. Sometimes the full contours of a legal question can best or only be seen from the perspective of those who are most affected. This applies to questions as profoundly gendered as abortion, and as fashionably neutral as the taxation of business expenses. This practical lesson showed up in the court's equality jurisprudence, which recognizes that those who are subject to discrimination are the only ones who are able to see it clearly. This jurisprudence requires that the discrimi discriminatory distinction be assessed from the perspective of a reasonable person in the claimant's position. Analytically, perspective makes a very real difference. For example, the matter of perspective divided the court on section 15 in Canadian Foundation for Children and Youth, a 2004 case 
challenging the constitutionality of the corporal punishment provisions of the criminal code. Canadian Foundation was decided under an earlier approach to discrimination that assessed the impact of a law or program on the claimant's human dignity. The claimants in that case had argued that depriving children of the same protection against assault as adults sent the message that they are less capable or less worthy of recognition or value as a human being. The majority in Canadian Foundation elected not to assess the affront to human dignity from the perspective of the child, but from the perspective of the, of the person acting on behalf of the child. The consequence of this shift in perspective, which Justice Binney pointed out in dissent, may have made it more difficult to see the real harm to a child's dignity. Even though human dignity is no longer part of the test for a breach of Section 15, perspective still does important work. It helps to identify less visible forms of harm to identity, including those targeting self-determination, self-worth, self-confidence, and self-respect. Many would be difficult, if not impossible, to see clearly without adopting the perspective of the claimant. Seeing things from another perspective can be a challenging reasoning exercise. It is not one that is limited to Section 15. Nevertheless, it is an obligation on all judges, even where it is not explicitly mandated by the jurisprudence. The role of perspective is perhaps most salient in the context of Aboriginal law. Translating between indigenous and non-indigenous legal traditions is a delicate exercise. It sometimes involves putting the unfamiliar in familiar terms in order to work through a problem. In the dialogue between legal traditions, there is always a risk that something will be lost in translation. But this risk can only be managed, not avoided. A similar challenge arises between civil and common law. Even with all that practice, stepping into someone else's shoes in the charter case it is much easier said than done. This is so precisely because perspectives are formed by a myriad of unique experiences. In the equality context, asking judges to look at patterns of discrimination from a perspective that, let's face it, they, they often do not share, is a difficult reasoning exercise. But our equality jurisprudence insists on it with good reason. With all of that in mind, I turn to a question. What is next for identity under the Charter? I would like to suggest that the, li the link between identity and democracy deserves some attention. Democratic principles are fundamental to how we think about justification. Some of the most difficult justification questions are those where the law or program at issue goes to the heart of someone's individual or group identity. How can a law that implicates the core of someone else, someone's sense of self be justified? I think re-engaging with fundamental democratic principles may offer tools for a robust justification analysis in such difficult case. I see re-engaging because, of course, in the Oaks case, which set out how to analyze potential charter violations, the Supreme Court interpreted the words free and democratic society under Section 1. The values and principles enumerated in Oaks to give content to those words are timeless. Human dignity, the accommodation of difference, respect for identity, and faith in participatory political institutions. But how society is think about democracy continues to evolve. On occasion, the Supreme Court has recognized that Canada 
is not just a democracy, but a deliberative democracy. Democratic theory, too, has taken a deliberative turn. The basic commitment of democracy is that decisions and laws ought to have the consent of those who are affected. The basic commitment of deliberative democracy is that decisions and laws ought to be justifiable to those who are affected. Justifiable in the deliberative democratic sense means that those affected would agree to decisions on their own terms under conditions of meaningful dialogue. This notional dialogue has to take place under some essential conditions. In particular, participants are recognized as equally deserving of concern, of respect, and consideration. It is not a coincidence that these are also the objectives of Section 15, as set out 30 years ago in Andrews, the first Supreme Court case to deal with Section 15 equality rights. Equality infringements treat people as less worthy of the very re recognition that is essential to deliberative democracy. The court recognized this link in Watcott in 2013 when it acknowledged that one of the profound arms of the hate speech is forcing a group to argue for their basic humanity or social standing as a precondition for participating in the deliberative aspects of our democracy. Hate speech is an extreme example, but there is a broader insight here. Differential treatment on the basis of identity may signal to the person or group affected by it that they are somehow less worthy of recognition. The signal can be louder in some cases than others. Laws that send such signals whether in purpose or effect, undermine the essential conditions of democratic dialogue. They do so precisely because they compromise the affected party status as a full participant in deliberative democracy. Thus, these laws or, or programs should be more difficult to justify on democracy. In other words, such laws inherently tilt the field against the possibility of deliberative justification by denying equal recognition. They compromise the equal human dignity recognized as an essential democratic value in Oaks. The concept of human dignity has had a troubled tra trajectory in the Supreme Court's equality jurisprudence. As a means of identifying a Section 15 breach, human dignity became a vague and irrelevant barrier for equality claimants. But human dignity anchors equality in the fundamentally democratic aspirations of the Charter. It still has some work to do because it provides the essential conceptual link between equality and democracy. For me, this is a crucial point. As Section 1 states specifically, a charter infringement must be justified as a reasonable limit in a free and democratic society. This is where I see human dignity perhaps playing a conceptual role in the justification analysis. Much like a limit on free expression becomes more difficult to justify when it lies at the core of Section 2B protection, an equality infringement ought to be increasingly difficult to justify to the extent that it strikes at the heart of someone's individual or group identity. And with it, their recognition as full participants in Canada's ongoing democratic dialogue. Ultimately, human dignity offers a language for casting the arms of inequality in democratic terms. The concept enables us to find common ground provides a touchstone, touchstone for the difficult work of consensus building and provides a common frame of reference for justifying difficult situations when the rights and freedoms the Charter guarantees are in tension with one another. In conclusion, for more than 150 years now, 
the Constitution has enabled Canadians to navigate difficult questions of identity. As I mentioned at the outset, there was some mixed early success. The Charter has helped us clarify and focus on these questions. But Charter interpretation, too, is a work in progress. Substantive equality, as it has developed in our jurisprudence, ensures meaningful protections for those aspects of our identity that make us who we are and define our experiences. It ensures that those personal and group characteristics cannot be undermined in a way that compromises our right to equal and meaningful participation in our common political community. Moving forward, we have many reasons to be optimistic about the ways that identity has been incorporated into our notions of equality, democratic values, and fundamental human dignity that permeate the Charter. These notions also lay the foundation for looking beyond our own borders. We can welcome refugees and migrants with the confidence that our society is able not only to manage our differences, but to thrive on them. We have all heard the debate over the years as to whether there is indeed a true Canadian identity. If anything, I think it is our ability to embrace a multiplicity of identities at once that sets us apart. I thank you for your attention. So we're going to take about uh, 10 minutes or so of questions, but before I open it to the floor, we have a question from our students in Nunavut, which we've recorded. As some of you know, but some of you may not know, we have 23 students currently completing the end of their first year of their law degree in Nunavut, and we want them to participate in these things. The, the internet connections are not great, but what we have is a video. Question from Nastanya, one of our students. So, if the technology cooperates. Hello, my name is Nastanya Mullen, and I'm a part of the Nunavut Law Program, also affiliated with the University of Saskatchewan. Thank you, Chief Justice Wagner, for attending this and allowing us to ask questions. So, my question pertains to that there has never been a Supreme Court justice come from the territories. This current Supreme Court appointment convention ensures provincial representation but ignores the territorial representation. It is difficult for people and individuals in Nunavut to have any sense of identity and feel confident that the Supreme Court decisions take into account our identity and concerns. When no Supreme Court judge has ever come from Nunavut or has been Inuit, and when the current appointment process offers little hope that this will change. The Supreme Court justices, some of them do have experience on the Nunavut Court of Appeal, but none have directly come from Nunavut. So my questions today are, do you think, with the unique interests of Inuit and Northerners, do you think that we're being represented in the court? Also, do you support having a Supreme Court justice come from the territories? And finally, do you think it's possible under the current constitutional framework that a justice be selected from the territories without practicing and being a member of a provincial law society. Thank you so much. Those are very good questions. <laughs> <laughs> Those are very good questions because they are in line with uh, about what I just uh, told you in my lecture about uh, the importance of identity on, the, uh, on democracy. I always believed, and I said it many times, that I wish that every citizen could be seen and consider themselves to be reflected in society. In other words, in the courts, in other institutions as well. 
because if people don't recognize themselves in the institutions, there will be a lack of trust, and that could influence, of course, the, the, the nature of the democracy. So I think that the question is very important. I think it's, uh, it's a very good question. I think that uh, insofar as the appointment is concerned, of course, uh, uh, you have to realize that uh, to appoint a justice of the Supreme Court is, uh, you know, belongs to the Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, but uh, I think that um, uh, for me, speaking for myself, I would be, um, I would be honored one day to sit beside a uh, justice who would come from the territories, uh, a justice, uh, indigenous people, that he or she could uh, provide his or her perspective of life, of the law, uh, of his or her experience. I would be honored to sit with that person. Well, it's up to the prime minister to decide. And, but I, 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 I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful and uh, I think we should be optimistic as to the outcome. I just hope that it will happen before I leave the court. So we have about uh, eight minutes, so I'll open the floor to questions. Obviously, the Chief Justice can't answer questions about specific cases, et cetera. So he